Hi, this is David O'Hare, and this is the Functional Tennis Podcast. Welcome to the Functional Tennis Podcast. I'm Fabio Molly, your host, and I've taken a few weeks off, and we're back now. Today, I have a super exciting episode with David O'Hare, a friend of mine who was previously on the show just before COVID, and we had plans to take on a coaching role at the university he attended in Memphis, where he was one of the best college tennis players in the States, along with his partner, world number one now, Joe Salisbury. So he tells us uh, what happened there and how he is now working with Joe and Rajiv Ram. He's their traveling coach, which is such an amazing opportunity and all the work he's been doing there, helping them stay at the top of the world doubles rankings. And yeah, you're gonna love it. I'll include a link below to the previous episode with Dave. And he also mentioned some other episodes, including Louis Kaye. I'll include links to them below also. And yeah, I hope you enjoy it. Before we get started, shout out to our podcast sponsor, Slinger, who make the portable ball machine, the Slinger Bag. Check out slingerbag.com if you want to know more about it. Or you can send me a question or leave a question in the comments below. I've been using one now for over two years and I'm happy to answer all questions. Okay, here's our chat. Hi Dave. How's it going? Welcome back, to, welcome back to the Functional Tennis Podcast. How Thank are you? you? Yeah, great. Thanks for having me again. Uh, great to have you home. You tell us all about your Grand Slam experiences now in a few minutes. But first, the last time you were on the podcast was pre-COVID. It didn't exist. Yeah. And you were waiting on a visa to go to the States. So yeah. tell us what's happened. So I uh, suppose, yeah, since then, um, I stopped with Rajiv and Joe back in yeah, just at the O2, just after the O2 uh, in 2019, and had a visa pending uh, to go back to the States to be assistant coach in the college system over there. Just a lot of drawn out requests for further evidence, and it took, yeah, the best part of seven, eight months, and culminated in me being denied a visa. Uh, yeah, come end of, end of January, early Feb. So, again, pre kind of lockdowns and whatever else. So, that was the first major challenge, I suppose, in in my life, you know, because in November I was at a great junction between, you know, potentially staying on with Joe and Rajiv or going and having like a little bit more routine life and being based somewhere and, and college coaching is it's kind of a nice little sweet spot in, in tennis, I think, just the level's fun and, and that environment is great to be part. I certainly loved it as a player, so, I was really curious if, if as a coach it would kind of, yeah, evoke the same emotions yeah. from me or whatever. So, so yeah, I kind of had built up such a unicorn, and that's ultimately what took me from the tour myself in 2018, as I thought that that position was going to open up in in the summer of 2018. So I kind of had a, a dodgy ankle, you know, tore my medial lateral ligaments in January 2018, and then the position looked like it was going to open up and then last minute it fell through and then you know that's and I sidestepped to coaching on the tour with Bambo which afforded me the opportunity with Joe and Rajiv and then at that time during, during Wimbledon 2019 that's when 100% the the coach had left and that's when my visa process had started yeah. that July so so yeah so that's been the, the update so then after obviously COVID hit and and I was a little bit lost and didn't really know what to do um, and I was very fortunate to get back on the tour with Mitch Kruger so I did um, just over a year with Mitch and then kind of tail end of last year uh, Rajiv and Joe reached out and were interested if, if I'd be keen to yeah to travel this year with them so started up in yeah at the ATP Cup just in January uh, so yeah so it was great. Well, for those that don't know much about Dave, we do have another podcast episode where you tell us your life story. Yeah. Up to that point, <laughs> up to the point where he was going to the States, in, uh, where you were planning to go to the States, so I yeah. will link to that. Okay. Uh, we don't need to go through that now. It's, <laughs> it's one of the better episodes, I will say that. Oh, so, thanks very much. Uh, but so tell me, so you start working with Mitch Kruger. Yeah. How, what, what was it like? I you know a lot of your experiences in doubles. Uh, I know you do work with some singles guys as well, but how was that, first of all, different to working with doubles was it a challenge for you it was a challenge and I think I was pretty fortunate and how it all came about was um, I kind of just tried to put all my I tried to be productive during COVID and and put all my learnings down on on paper and, and emailed it to a few different people and one of the coaches was Brad Stein 
and Brad was kind of consulting with Mitch and, and he was one that connected us so I kind of just I got to know him pretty well just from being on the tour a couple of coffees here and there and I thought listen I'll shoot this your way and let me know what you think and I kind of just sparked you know a couple of days in the bench where we'd jump on the phone for an hour and a bit at a time and he'd send over his stuff I'd come back with this and and yeah and so we just kind of like-minded chat and and yeah he, he got me involved with Mitch which which was a challenge for sure because you're kind of you know you're obviously high standards for Mitch and you're kind of saying oh no you need to do this and then I was like Jesus if only I could have done that as a, as a singles yeah. player whereas at least to some point I had experienced those feelings or executed to some level on you know to, to a professional standard on the double side whereas singles I was nowhere near the level that, that Mitch was just at. Just jump in here what are those things that you could have done differently or maybe somebody else can do differently today? Um, well, I just, just I think believing in myself, just trusting how I how I saw the game, and and I think the one great asset that that doubles coaches or doubles players maybe have is we bring such a specific approach to each practice, and it's so related to our game style, and, and you can recreate these kind of game specific situations. And now, granted, it's a lot easier to do it in doubles than it is singles, but I think having that sort of approach, um, you know, bringing that into to a singles mindset is actually hugely beneficial. So I really believe in that. And it was just my first event with Mitch was actually the French Open. And, and you know what it's like at the French Open qualies, it's an absolute war zone trying to get a half an hour course or an hour course and you're sharing and this, that and the other. Um, but just coming from the kind of practices that I'd been so accustomed to with Joe Najib where it was, you know, we're analyzing matches and collecting data and, you know, we know what areas we need to prove and it might be like tactical and, and opponent related, what we want to brush up on going into, you know, our next round or whatever it may be. Um, but there's generally like pre-planned session um, and coming from that environment into just like half court at the French Open for like, you know, an hour session in the morning, an hour in the afternoon. And I was just like, you know what, I, I, I think we can do something. You know, I was like, I'll give you an hour of that and you can have your rhythm and your feel good yeah. and, and that's fine. But like, give me an hour in the afternoon where we can kind of like address something related to your game that's a bit more specific and, and, and really try and develop and improve some components of your game. So that's kind of where I think the doubles mindset or attribute as a coach maybe could be beneficial for singles players just trying to keep it a bit more structured at times now it can't be all structured you know and I, I, I don't want I would never want Mitch to like or anyone that I work with to like not express themselves you know and, and to be rigid in a style of play if you feel good and, and you feel like you're actually you can go for it but I think there's real comfort at times to have somewhat of a blueprint to like you know for all 30 all and if you're kind of like okay maybe i'll just let the ball speak to me and yeah. you know you know stick to my my base plan or whatever that may be then that's quite comforting what's it like as a coach up there when whether singles or doubles where they just not follow the game plan they're just free just playing it as it is like well yeah i mean you're i mean it's you know you're obviously frustrated for them and you know they're the ones that are, that are having to go out and in between the lines and it's it's a war you know especially in, in singles you know what the guys are doing uh, you know all the sacrifice that I, all the teams make and and, and everyone deserves <laughs> to be out there fighting um but invariably for me i always look back and like shit what could i have done better how could i have prepared them better how could i have you know where is my wrongdoing in this what, what, what were the faults and I guess that's just, maybe not everyone's that way, but certainly I feel, uh, I have a strong connection with all the people that I've played with, so, or coached to this point, so I kind of like, shit, you know, I feel for them, and, and I kind of, yeah, I'm always quick to maybe judge myself and how I could have better prepared them. Yeah. Um, but albeit, they, they, you know, I think they, we try our best to separate particularly with the guys now, like the, the kind of performer self, so like tennis aside and how are you, how is your energy and we talk a lot about like our non-negotiables and the attributes and, and the roles that we play to bring to the team um, and then you know we kind of, 
we separate that from just the level and, and if all our controllables aren't met then there's not much point in talking about the tennis sure. so so we kind of we fraction it out that way a little bit and tell me what what sort of team did Mitch have I know with Johnny Rajiv which we talk about in a while that they've a big they have a good solid yeah, team yeah great team yeah what, what was it like coming from I think Mitch had a much smaller team to a much bigger team like yeah what, how do you, is it more work for you is it less fun or is it more um, challenging yeah I mean it's a bit of both I think um, you we're obviously at the minute with you know Joe being the position that he's in and Rajiv being the position that they're in they get a lot of support from from the LTA and and, and a lot of you know analytics and data and Darkfish, which is a program that kind of collects matches and whatever um, on opponents or is all charted. So that kind of makes the scouting a great deal easier for me. I can kind of filter through a match and look at specific return or specific whatever it may be. Uh, I can filter through that, and and that's fantastic resource to have. Whereas with Mitch. You know, it was kind of just a lot of me trying to, you know, get some some data on, you know, Challenger TV or you know, at live stream when it was on live stream and, and just get a get a feeling for the opponent and, and yeah, I mean that was that was a challenge. Um, but again, I was fortunate in that, you know, I mentioned Brad and, and Louis Kaye and, and I've had great mentors in and Mitch is another long long standing coach, a guy called Dave Licker. Um, He's done actually. I think his um, he coaches this Live Hove Hovid. I'm not sure how to pronounce her second name, but she just won Junior Wimbledon. Oh, she is based out of Dallas. The Taylor Dent Academy. Oh, is she okay? Well, he was with her at the French Open, so he's had some help. Yeah. So, um, so yeah. So, so t- you know, a lot of experience in Dave, a lot of experience in Brad Stein. So, I generally there's good stream of communication between all three of us and kind of getting Mitch ready because. You know, you're kind of going straight into the deep end of a grand slam, yeah. and I don't know Mitch all that well, yeah. albeit I was kind of familiar with him from my days on the tour, and, and he would have been playing singles at the same events. Um, so I kind of I knew of him, and I've had one or two dinners with him, and, and whatever else, but I didn't really know him, or I didn't know his game. So I caught him at a, an exciting time where he made a, a big change in his game, and it was just kind of about, you know, make, making sure he believes in that. And, you know, he, he did really well, he just won his first round. Um, uh, he beat me around Tim Van Rithoven. Oh, he's, in, he's, yeah, he's, doing, he's doing quite well, so Mitch took him out there in, in Newport. So great to see. So shout out to Mitch. And <laughs> tell me, so before we move on to your current job, yeah. what one thing did you learn from working with Mitch that stands out the most? Um, I guess just, I mean, loads, but I think, as I said, I alluded to it, just like believing that. The way I see the sport and, and addressing these kind of, you know, your game-based approach to your addressing your strengths and, and mastering a few related to your game style is is the best way to go forward to try and really, you know, because it's really hard. You know, there's a lot of really good tennis players. So if you try and copy, you know, I think you need to be maybe staying true to yourself and try and improve your strengths and and, and yeah, express yourself out there. I think that's probably the best way to get. The best from you in a controlled environment <laughs> yeah, well sometimes uh, sometimes yeah, yeah. yeah sometimes i mean yeah i think you know if there's one advice i think i even maybe said this in the last one it's just like geez get out and hit 20 offensive forehands you know or whatever it may be i think that's one thing that i found myself talking a lot about with um with players that i work with back in dublin or on the road you know i think Aggressive is 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 a uh, is a heavily used word, and I don't think it actually accurately represents what we want to get from our players. You know, I think aggressive to me kind of seems a bit rash and rushed and not in control. Whereas, like offensive, which is I think what coaches are trying to actually evoke like, from their players. Just explain offensive a bit more there for somebody who's come from the like for aggressive is like. Big serve, big yeah. forehand, point one, you know? Yeah, well, I, I mean, offensive is the same, right? I, I think it's the same, but there's just, there's maybe an element of, of a bit more precision with that, you know? I think from, you know, the bits that I've done on tour and I look back on my own tennis journey and, and my fallings and shortcomings, and I think one thing that, like, 
situational awareness, like understanding actually what situation you're in, in the, por in, in the point and labeling it actually helps, you know, but far too often I was out of position trying to hit an offensive shot. It's like, what are you doing? You know? And I think in a lot of like squad culture where you get like 12 plus players, you know, over Bay of Courts, like those shots are made then and there and it's almost like congratulated and it's like, he's the hero. He made an amazing yeah. low percentage shot. And it's like, actually that's the total wrong shot. Like that shouldn't be encouraged. I am you know what I mean? Like, so I think understanding that actually your best chance in the, you know, percentage wise is to, you know, get back neutral or defensive or offensive and understanding those roles, I think is quite important. Obviously, I'm sure some players can do that a bit naturally. That's just yeah. the game style. It's just what it is and they're lucky, but can it be coached? I think so. I think that's where, um, you know, I go back to my experience on the tour and once I got exposed to a little bit of Louis Calle's, again, that blueprint and understanding, you know, I think if you can take shot selection out of decision time, then I think execution has a better chance of increasing. So, so you know, having these plays that you know you're going to run at, at important points in the match, you know, that's something that we'll often talk about going into a match is, you know, where are we going to serve and what are we going to look to do? Um, that would be a big part of my scouting going into any match would be like, you know, what situation we're going to put our opponents in that they're not comfortable, that they're going to have to execute in order to beat us. You know, we want to take their strengths away from them. So where is our serving targets on a 30 all point or what we're going to look to do? Okay, we'd like to pull it line. Okay, so we, you know, maybe we'll play regular, or, you know, whatever it is. So we'll take the target away from So you'll have to go cross to avoid, you know, whatever it may be. Um, so, yeah. And it, but it allows you, if you have a plan, it allows you to be more analytical then at the end of it saying, okay, here's the plan. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's it's it also helps because right, like we've all been out there and it's so hard to remain objective as a tennis player. Right, you're so caught up in your emotions and invariably, any time I've watched myself back and I thought I was particularly poor or particularly good, invariably like I was somewhere in the middle. Any time I thought I had really good energy and I was really vibing and I played well, actually it looked much the same as when I was <laughs> playing bad. You know, but but then I have these amazing perception of how bad I was and how poor I looked and da 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 so so I think having a blueprint and a plan and if you have someone there watching that can hold you accountable to that is maybe the best way to try and improve yeah there's no worse than a coach telling you off like why do you do this and yeah. asking questions and yeah it's tough but tell me so when did the opportunity come around to work with Joe and Rajiv for this so that that kind of just happened at the, at the tail end of last year so it would have been kind of November and um, once they finished up at the O2, I think was when Joe had reached out and we kind of started chatting then and there. So, uh, so yeah, so obviously I was kind of keen. It's kind of come full circle in, in a way. Um, I think at that you know point in time back in, in November in 19, I think I, pr I would have rather, I recognized that the guy, I mean, I think I'm even on the podcast saying that they'll probably win a couple yeah. slams and sure enough, you know, a couple weeks later there they are. Yeah win in Australia so so I, I believed a lot in the team and I felt like we'd made some good inroads um, you know our last few months together um, so I recognized there was huge potential there but just with the I was going back to the University of Memphis where I went and I've got a great relationship with the head coach there Paul Gogol and it just didn't feel like the right thing last minute to yeah. kind of stab him in the back albeit that I would have maybe wanted to because I recognised that it was a yeah. huge opportunity um, but it didn't feel right it's just a shame that, that the process was so prolonged um, that you know if, uh, yeah if I got denied early November I'm sure Jesus if the lads would have had me on great yeah, that's yeah. to get ready and go down to Australia sounds great you know and tell me did you how did you feel working with them the second time did you feel more confident were you more prepared for it yeah, I think I think the mindset, you know, obviously before this, you know, Memphis was already it was kind of like this unicorn that I that I built up since 2018. So at that point in time, I was, you know, it was quite novel. It was cool to be at the big events, but it it wasn't I, at that point in time. I wasn't long term in it with them. I was, of course, wanted to do a good job and be prepared and be professional. 
but I was always kind of, you know, yeah, this is a great experience for Memphis. Yeah. Whereas now this this go round, I'm, yeah, I'm locked in now. This is me. I'm going to be a traveling coach for the next few years. You know, so um, yeah, trying to just learn as much as I can, and fortunate that. Like you said, we might get talking about the team that's involved and, and to continue to, you know, I'm far from the finished product and I have a lot to learn and coaching and, and everything, but uh, but yeah, fortunate to be, you know, so close to the top of the game and uh, and learning off some great people. And what sort of ranking did the guys have when you started working with them the second time around? So they were two, okay. they were two in the world. and. So yeah, so it was kind of like a bit, you know, but daunting. There's been yeah, there's been many players stuck at two in the world. But there's been many players. So they've no, they've done they've done great, and you know everyone's got facing their own challenges. Um, but yeah, no, we're obviously a great, very fortunate now to be number one team in the world. Um, so Joe ranked one and Raj two. Just with that, it's funny. They uh, the reason why they're Joe's one is um, I think before. Uh, Davis Cup last year it was actually Rajiv's idea to s split one week and play with their Davis Cup partners yeah. just to get a few matches under the belt. So, oh, yeah, that seems a pretty good idea. So, obviously, Rajiv was to play with Jack Sock, and Jack had got injured at the US Open, so they ended up not playing. But Joe and Neil Skubski had already committed, so they ended up winning. Uh, San Diego, so he's a clean 250 points ahead of Rajiv in the rankings. So that's you know, and that's been that's been a real shame. I think you know maybe maybe Rajiv should play one 250 tournament. Um, yeah, maybe so. But then again, it'll it'll work in the inverse, right? Because Joe's San Diego points will drop off oh, yeah, and true, whatever else. True. So, but yeah, so it's it's funny, and I think I think actually Joe handled it really well, and um, you know, recognizing that it's. Because he's got a lot of the attention for it, right? You know, yeah. as soon as the number one name is solely beside your name, you're the you're the focus, which is not easy, I think, for Rajiv as well. Um, he played, you know, ninety eight percent the part of that, and, and Joe would admit that. So, um, so yes, yeah, so that was kind of lucky and unlucky in, in different and ways. So tell us about the team. What sort of team do the world's best doubles team have around them? Well, so I mean. Like I'm kind of the the travelling coach, let's say, um, and then Louis Kaye from the LTA side is kind of the consultant head coach, who really is the you know he's dubbed the, the mastermind or the doubles guru, and and I would go one further into that. He's just the tennis guru. He's mm -hmm. he's not really limited to doubles. He's he's fantastic, and I think that's been proven by uh, you know Emma's interest in working with him uh, Emma Raducanu and, and he's had his hand in, in a lot of people's game through, well, throughout the years. Brits are in the top 100? Was there uh, 8 or 9 at one stage? In yeah, there, male, not yeah, this, yeah in, in doubles alone yeah. yeah there was there was a shed load but when you know Bambo was playing and you know a few of them have, have kind of retired Bam and Don Inglot now but Nick Kenskowski too recently retired but yeah they, you know he's had his his hand in, in all that and, and you know I mean pretty yeah pretty comprehensive cv going in you know ahead of that with his work in, in tennis canada and you know we have had him on the podcast so have you had him on the a link to okay it below. he he just landed in new york um, okay at the us open last year and he was jumped on the phone and it was real he wouldn't probably be the most techie person in the world and you're having tech issues after when you're sending me the file yeah and uh, yeah it was really it's great like you could see the knowledge was yeah there. yeah he's he, there's one thing that that he brings such certainty and it's hard right because you know you, you know you obviously want to emulate great coaches and he's just he's got you know 30 plus years of experience and he's you know got his own formula and views on it but there's invariably there's always a fact with him you know he gives it gives an answer gives a fact and you know i think if i'm to comment on one of my failings as a coach is just yeah I, it almost came about as as a tennis player just feeling a bit insecure and whether i belong you know i'm talking mm -hmm. to you know, the number one team in the world and geez am I a little bit out of my depth here yeah. and you know like the I think imposter syndrome. Yeah, exactly. And I, I think I'm sure people feel that in all sorts of facets of life, but but yeah, part of me is kind of like, God, you know, yeah, do I trust it in just the tone, but he's just 
for not really like a a player, let's say, um, you know, he, he wouldn't have achieved like yeah. what I what other guys have achieved on the court in terms of playing ability, but the, the manner in which he sees the game and the certainty in how he delivers it and how he communicates, because ultimately that's all it comes down to, right? Mm-hmm. How, how he delivers the the message across, and he, he is phenomenal. And even what I found interesting, obviously he gets results out of play. If you do details, you, you're going to get yeah, results. Yeah. So I'm sure I need to call him at some stage. Yeah, you know, no, he, to, he's, but he's, he's fabulous. Yeah. When he landed in New York that time, he was saying he, had, he was going off to the courts and he was working with like eight or nine different teams that day. And yeah. They, were all, like, they all met to make sure everybody gets their slots. Like yeah. Most coaches work with one player. I know, and yeah. He's got, he's got a huge amount and he's got his own little hierarchy. So he kind of... Yeah, he try, tries to fit everyone in, but if you know there's a conflict with whoever, then invariably it'll be the higher ranked player that will get priority. So when Jamie calls, you get the bump over Jamie. Do well, you? yeah, actually, I think their relationship is somewhat strained a little bit. They've kind of drifted okay. a little bit the past few years, and I'm not sure actually what happened. But maybe with Jamie's rank, and as his rank goes down, well, I don't know. Yeah, I don't know, but I think they they still have it's very amicable now. But but I think. Uh, I mean, it might be tough, you know, if you, if, you know, you've been there, if you've been there and you've been the priority and then all of a sudden you're not and then you're kind of, oh, screw you, you know, whatever. Yeah, yeah, I can see it. Um, but yeah, but, but, uh, so, okay, so there's yourself, there's Louis. So myself from, from the LTA side, then Joe's got the strength and conditioning coach, um, Ollie Fells, then he's got Danny, uh, who's kind of physio, um, Justin Shearing, who's Joe's kind of long, long-term coach since he was you know a young man and um, based just at the local club or yeah he's at uh, weybridge tennis okay. so he's he's a, he had um he had jack draper at a young age he was jack draper's coach so he's had his hand in, in a lot of development a lot of great players so again you know just great people to to have on the sidelines yeah. and to be brushing shoulders with and and, and chatting in between yeah. points and momentum and you know all that kind of stuff you know so there's always there's always learning opportunities around then and then on Rajiv's side, um, he's got a, a good friend of his, Chris Eaton, okay. um, who... English guy? Yeah, English guy, yeah, yeah he's co- college coach in the States, um, and and yeah, just travelled with um, John Piers, and I think he was with Jamie, he was mostly with John, and then he was with Conton and Piers for a while, and then he took his role, but played played a high level yeah. himself. Um, I don't know his full bio, but I think he's won a couple of rounds at Wimby Dubs and whatever else. So, you know, he's no scrub. And then Rajiv also has um, long-term coach Brian, um, who's back in Indiana where Rajiv is originally from. So they're kind of all the moving parts. Um, How do you manage so There's a lot of moving parts there. And obviously yeah. there's a focus on two players. I know there's a focus yeah. on two players and the team. Yeah. But do you have a big WhatsApp group? That's well, yeah. So it, yeah, invariably, invariably. Um, so yeah, I just reach out on occasion. I, I kind of chat to maybe Chris the most um, about Rajiv and, and just get his thoughts on on previous matches or, or whatever it may be. And then Louis and I would have a fairly yeah healthy stream of communication. Yeah. Just partly because I, I want to learn so much from yeah. him. Um, so so yeah so he'll he'll constantly kind of challenge and then doing a few reports post match and you know highlighting any areas that you know anything that we've addressed in practice and it was particularly good that day highlighting it so the guys have it in their head and they've done good and it's just constant little reminders yeah. you know the guys know how to play tennis <laughs> yeah i say the whole the challenging from Louis can be tough but that's where you probably learn the most where exactly he's asking yeah. a question you're like oh god yeah no you're, you're put on the spot a lot which is which is good and um, you know if you want a bit of juice you got to squeeze the squeeze the orange squeeze the lemon so so yeah that's one of his he's quoted for saying that at many a conference but yeah he's yeah he's a, he's a great influence to have for sure um, tell me so you're just freshly back freshly wounded from wimbledon yeah five match points yeah we had uh just tell us what it's like sitting in the box i mean your guys are out there and blown these match points i know they probably weren't blown and they were taking yeah. out their hands because yeah i mean it's it's tough and it's it's kind of it's been two on the bounce now you know we had a few match points in the quarters of the french open as well so that, that you know then that hurts and i think for most you know obviously you know you know 
semis of a Grand Slam is, is a great achievement, but, but I think the position that we, we put ourselves in and, and, and the team that we think we are, you know, falling falling short uh, is not what we want to do. So it's, it's, it's a shame, obviously, I think the guys are hurting no more than all the team are hurting. It was, it was tough to watch. Um, you know when you when you miss those opportunities and you feel like they deserve it and you know they're a little bit unfortunate how a few of the points unfolded and credit to the to the Aussies they faced a lot of match points en route and you know in the first round I think they saved three and, and yeah. they fought hard so you know I mean all of a sudden I'm kind of like again I'm pointing the finger at myself geez how can I you know should I have addressed that you know I mean like they're well callous they're dogged lads you know it's not over until it's over you know like you know, I kind of just always tend not to try and, you know, even the guys will say that they want me to be tougher on them. Yeah. Um, and that's maybe just a part of my nature. I kind of feel like I'm a bit of a positive guy and, and empathize with them because I, I, was, I was a very critical, you know, like we all can be very critical player. And I think one of the big, big inroads that I made was last year I was very fortunate to play Davis Cup for Ireland again and I had during COVID I picked up a load of different yeah. things and I came across the phase and it was actually a trading like a, I did this kind of trading course and this guy talked about um, mental posture and I'd never really heard the term and I kind of thought geez that's a great term you know that it kind of stuck with me for some reason and he was kind of like don't take you know it was a little bit of a community and you know you put the trade on you deserve you know you did the right thing you know consult own the trade don't like have a locus of control have self-compassion learn from it move on if you made a bad trade you know all this kind of stuff and um there's i sent i sent a bit of this to there's a guy in ireland uh rory o'hannon who's a keen tennis player and a very very successful cardiologist and you know like-minded kind of just all about kind of self-improvement yeah. and just you know manages his minutes he's a busy guy you know we've got 20 mri reports to write day and you're very inspirational geezer really so we kind of had a few of these these chats with him and uh he just one of the mornings i was having a hit with him he goes you know it's like it's like all these self-help books it all comes back to one equation e plus r equals o event plus reaction equals the outcome and that was that was quite powerful and so then later in the day i was uh and i think this would be a big cornerstone of my my philosophy i think going forward i was having a session with another kid and the kid should be beating me right i'm not moving particularly mm. well particularly in a singles course it's, it's not a pretty sight so but anyway i'm competing he should win in three, we're playing just a city game, first ball cross, play it to seven or whatever it may be. So I'm kind of hanging around and sneak a set or two and anyway, find myself in, in the fifth set, the deciding set. And he literally plays the dream point. Constructs it perfectly, finishes a great winner, everything that you'd want to draw up. Mm. So the event was obviously really good, right? He played the dream point, but his reaction, his his he wasn't grounded in reality in that moment because his, his reaction, albeit he said, come on, he said it in such a, a tone that he was actually like rooted in frustration because in his head it shouldn't have gone to five cents and it shouldn't have, yeah. but it is, that's the reality. Yeah. So, so then positive event, negative reaction, albeit that his words were come on, but like really like from a- Frustration. Yeah, yeah, yeah really stemmed in kind of anger and frustration yeah. and and then he plays a couple terrible points to follow that up. And I was like, that's exactly what Rory talked about this morning, you know? So I'm often very good cop when I'm kind of yeah. doing the debrief with the lads and I kind of have a lot of like, you know, I have self-compassion, you know, because they would be highly critical. And to a certain degree, that landed them where they are yeah. now. But I think maybe there's, there's scope to reframe and actually be almost proud of and there's a difference between being proud and being complacent i think being proud of what they achieved and cutting themselves a bit of a break you know tennis isn't perfect it's never going to be and and i think you can yeah you can if you're going to be negative at a few things and you're not happy with a few elements of yeah. your game in practice well at least 
hitting you with some positive stuff when you're doing some good stuff. Invariably, like, they do some great things and they're like, oh, that's what it, that's how it should be. It's like, no, it shouldn't. You're going to be negative when you're negative, be positive when you're, you know. Yeah. That's kind of how I feel. So, so often the guys kind of tell me off for being maybe a little bit too nice. <laughs> Not wrong being too nice. I'm sure Louis come in with the bad stuff. Sometimes Louis, yeah, about. maybe we compliment but each other well. I'm sure. I, I think any successful athlete will be crit- self-critical, and that's what gets them there. But I'm sure yeah. it's the one who understands that and can move on, like you yeah. say, understand it better. They get to stay there a bit longer. Yeah, yeah. So I hope that's kind of that's what I what I bring to the team you know I think there was a great event to just finish that story when I when I played Davis Cup uh, so we were in the, the final match bear in mind I had no I hadn't played a match I hadn't really played at all I played one or two club matches in the UK and that was about it and my preparation so you know a little it's bit of call up yeah yeah so <laughs> yeah. so I wasn't I wasn't you know so I knew mentally I had to be very good because I hadn't put the work in kind of physically or you know I hadn't certainly wasn't the player that I previously was when I took to the course. I knew mentally I had to be trying to be very good. Um, so on this particular occasion, uh, and it's probably what I'm most proud of, albeit that Ireland got promoted and whatever else, and that was fantastic. But in this little mini crisis, um, we were we were setting a break up. We'd just broken. Who are you playing with? So I was playing with Simon Carr okay. against Georgia. Um, for promotion, so this is in the World Group Three for playoffs, so for third place, and great week. So I'm, you know, I'm obviously at this point in time, I'm not working with Joan Regine, but I've had the experience of working with the top team in the world. So I'm kind of, you know, leading the chat at the change of ends, and I'm kind of all right. You know, my serve now two one up. Let's consolidate. Let's, you know, first serve here. Invite, invite, don't invite pressure. Blah, blah, blah. So. You know, of course, what do I do? Miss my first serve. I miss a volley. Okay, okay, no worries. We get this one. First yeah. serve, high percentage. You know, like we talked about. I miss a serve. Simon misses a volley. Okay, so then you know, here I am staring at the barrel of thirty, and miss another first serve. But actually, in that moment, that was the first one that actually felt good. Okay. So felt good, and as I hit it, I was like, "Oh, that one was good. That was good, though." So then that just totally shifted my mindset then actually stepping up to hit a second serve. Whereas my previous playing self would have been like, oh, you've ruined it, you know, you've missed three first serves in a row, way to invite pressure and roll out the red carpet, invite them back into the match, da da da, da. But in that moment, I, I, I was objective, I hit a good serve. So then how did I feel actually stepping up to hit my second serve? Quite good, actually. So the event, albeit, was negative, right? I missed my first serve, but my reaction was good, and then the outcome was good because then I feel good and hit yeah. a good second serve. So then 15 30, good first serve, 30 all, good first serve, 40 30, good first serve game. And that was just like in that moment, that was almost like revolutionary for me, and that was just all mindset. Um, and I, I really believe in that actually. Um, I think that's. I mean, you know, you, you can't be a mental warrior alone and make yeah. it, you know, you obviously have to have, you know. Did it help? But it helped. It helped in that moment for me, you know, I, I nearly collapsed. And you guys, did you win? Yeah, we won it, yeah. So we got, we got promoted and it, it was brilliant. But yeah, for me, that was like, it was almost like a culmination of the past few, few months of what I'd almost been through and learned and, and, and what I'd managed. Yeah. And, and yeah, and that was a, a significant moment for me. And I think this is a two-tier question. It goes back to what you said earlier about come back here. You should be guys that should be able to beat you. You know, yeah. you, what's it like when you do come back here and you're playing guys? And you're like, I'm still winning matches here. Like we yeah. on the practice court. Are you surprised or disappointed um, that there's nobody here that's raising the bar? We I won't say nobody. That's a bit harsh. But there's not as many. As yeah, there should I mean, be. yeah. I guess it's just it's all cyclical, right? Mm-hmm. Like I think. Tennis Ireland are, are bringing in, you know, a new player development pathway for, for the younger kids, which I think is great. And I think I think back to my age group when I was growing up, and I had the like, you know, a lot of people in, in Irish, you know, you had Morgan Dunn, Klusky, there was a good McGee, group of, you know, like uh, a lot, Darren McLaughlin, you know, a load of lads, Tristan Farman, like there was a shed load of lads ahead of us. They're like, Jesus, the Irish, Owen Healy, like the depth is yeah. there, like there are a lot of good players coming through. 
and then and then yeah, there, I mean, I, I I've kind of I don't I kind of lost touch with Irish yeah. tennis a little bit. I'm I'm just not around to know even who's coming through or a bit of a vested interest in Conor Gannon, just because I hit with him when yeah. I'm back in town, and 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 that's all I really know. And um, you influenced Conor to go. To and I, yeah, and I've influenced him, so he's now. Yeah, going to going to my alma mater, going to be a tiger at Memphis. So he was previously Tennessee. We had the podcast as well. And he told us a story there. It was a tough playing, like at six, and not every week you're playing. And yeah, tough, and tough. The coach was sounded like a tough job as well. Yeah, so I think yeah, it's he's going to be in for hopefully a better experience um, at Memphis. But but yeah, I think that you know they're 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 a big time program at Tennessee and. and and if you're not putting in the work as they see fit, then you know you're going to be you're going to be challenged. And, and you know, I think I think that's a good learning experience for him. And yeah. I hope he can actually channel that and use that and bring that to Memphis to some degree. And so yeah, I think it will be good for him. And we're going to end this with obviously you've been you've seen tennis of all levels now. You're at the top of the world's doubles game. Yeah. What, what ultimately can you teach or can you say to juniors and maybe the parents as well that could, that you've learned the past few years that um, could make a little difference to their tennis moving forward? Well, I think, I, you know, maybe as a, you know, if it's a young kid and a tennis parent just have like, if it's a big goal and they want to play professionally, like I think don't think short term, think longer term, you know, I think everyone is kind of like, maybe hell bent on results at 12, 13, 14, 15 when I think, you know, if, if you really want your kid to stay in the game long term or to afford a great opportunity to a college in the States, like it only really matters when you're 17, 18, right? Yeah. Like I think don't sacrifice, well, I mean sacrifice, but I, th I, wouldn't, I wouldn't zone in on just results. I would try and encourage if I had a kid, I was trying to encourage him to play the right way and, and lose the right way, but at least he's trying to do the right things, like not trying to create bad habits and push the ball or guide or, you know, yeah. I think tr trying to be the player that he wants to be and, and, and what the player that he is in practice and trying to bring that, you know, that's the best way to try and... To me, I actually, I don't even like the word practice now, I think. What's the better word? I feel like practice should be just like creating better habits. I feel like it, that's, that's what transfers over into the match court. And you see that directly. Where yeah, I see that. Like just build, building better habits. That's what's gonna. That's what's gonna impact on the match court better than anything else. So uh, yeah, every decision you make on the practice court. Yeah, trying to. Yeah, I think trying to. Yeah, it's a bit like see people. They miss an easy ball on the yeah. practice court, and yeah. the coach was like, "Why do you miss that person?" Oh, it doesn't matter. But turns out the match, you might miss. Yeah, that. exactly. So I think it's all. It's it's trying to bring that that perspective. Maybe I think relinquishing. The significance of results and how you play, and, and more focused on like actually building better habits to be a better player later down the line. If that's the goal, if the goal is just to have fun, then get out and have fun and, yeah. and do have whatever fun. you want to do. You know, I, I absolutely. But if if as a tennis parent listening, I I would, you know, because I think everyone's got a story of they've seen either when they were playing as a younger kid and there was a parent watching and they're heavily involved and whatever else and I think that's just I think everyone everyone doesn't want to be if I was a parent I wouldn't want to be that parent to my son I'd like to let them let them go and play and and you know is is I think that's the great thing about tennis that it, you know so much that you can learn about yourself between four lines and fail so often and I think I think to all my peers that, that I grew up playing tennis with and they've all done they've all been really successful in other spheres of life because tennis has taught, taught them how to mm. be kind of accustomed to failure and I think that's actually a really valuable asset <laughs> that, yeah, that no, a lot of people don't get exposed to yeah. and, and that's the that's the reality of tennis. You, really get, you get punched in the face. You get week. punched in the face and there's one winner every week and, 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 and there's no such thing as perfection out there um, and I think you can strive for excellence, sure, but perfection doesn't exist. And let's leave it there. That's a good one to leave. You can on. try, but, <laughs> but no thanks, Dave. I look forward to following up maybe in a couple of years' time when to see where yeah. the journey goes from there. Fingers crossed. Yeah, yeah. yeah I hope so. Great. Well, thanks a lot. Cheers, Fab.